Welcome to Engage, leading conversations that matter. Join in the conversation. Send an email to engage at cfpublic.org. Send a recorded talkback message on the free Central Florida Public Media app. Leave a voicemail by calling 407-273-2300, extension 246. Engage is made possible with the support of listeners like you. You are listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. I'm Sharon Stone. Coming up, a therapist and a member of the clergy weigh in on chaplains being authorized to serve students in Florida schools. Also, incorporating public art projects into public safety in Central Florida. First, though, we know it's going to be hot here in the summer, but hasn't it felt unbearable at times? Well, this wave of intense heat blanketed the country this week, and it has proven to be deadly on the West Coast. Millions of people in Texas are dealing with the weather without power after Hurricane Barrel hit Monday. Today, the National Weather Service warned of a moderate heat risk for all of East Central Florida. Dr. Sharag Panchel with Orlando Health Physician Associates is seeing more heat-related illnesses year over year. He joined Engage earlier this afternoon to discuss the dangerous heat and what he sees as a family medicine physician. You need to be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of heat exhaustion, not only in yourself, but also in other people. So that way you can be someone who helps or aids those close to you. So common signs or symptoms of heat related illness would be muscle cramping is a big one, excessive sweating that eventually maybe turns into even decreased sweating, changes in your mental cognition. So maybe you start to feel a little fuzzy. Sometimes people describe like the room is getting dark which is a little bit more severe. Sometimes people start to just feel weak. Maybe they're in the middle of a workout or they're outside mowing the lawn or they're taking care of the yard and they start to just feel all of a sudden very weak. Those are all common signs. In addition to the obvious ones, like really thirsty, uh, maybe you're going to the bathroom and you're going to pee and it's coming out really dark. Those are also some common signs that people should be aware about. Can you help me understand more about why heat is so dangerous? Uh, the National Weather Service says extreme heat is the deadliest type of extreme weather. What is it about heat that makes it so dangerous? Can it quickly just overtake a person? Yeah, so our body has innate cooling structures built into place to help thermoregulate us and keep us at a nice, even keel, you know, 98.5 degrees type of thing. Heat is sneaky. Right. So it's very hot outside. You're wearing all these clothes and then you get active into something. Maybe you're someone who works outside. Maybe you're someone who works out outside. And so it can really sneak up on you because you're doing all of these things that cause your heart rate to go up, that cause you to have more exertional fatigue. And on top of that, you're doing it now in almost record breaking temperatures in Florida, you know, 90 degrees, 100 degrees, where it feels like over 100 degrees, even with the humidity. In conjunction with that, I believe that there is a component of hydration and nutrition that we could all do a better job of to prevent these types of things. So, for example, as it continues to get hotter and the seasons change, you need to increase your hydration to be able to prevent these types of things from happening to you. You mentioned humidity. How does our humid heat differ from the dry heat? I'm thinking about the heat wave that happened in the West. And for example, a motorcyclist died from heat exposure. Granted, that was Death Valley, it was 128 degrees, but how does our humid heat differ from the dry heat insofar as someone's health is concerned? That's a great question. And while, you know, specifically speaking, we're, we're talking about all heat in general, the humidity factor, again, you know, it's like when you have dry heat versus humid or wet heat, you go outside and it feels like you're kind of breathing in more moist air, right? So it's a little bit harder to like take those deep breaths, especially if you're being exertional outside. Um, but again, all heat in general is going to cause your body's thermometer, so to speak, to start to rise. And your body's going to trigger all of these natural mechanisms that it has, like sweating, for example, to start to lower that temperature back down to where it feels comfortable. Can I ask you, are heat illnesses cumulative, meaning if you step inside and take a break, does your body kind of reset itself or does it just kind of keep adding up to become problematic? 
That is a great question. And you do want to do exactly what you mentioned, which is you want to pull away from the heat and then kind of allow your body to reset itself. And then you can go back out. So there is this thing that we call acclimatization, which is where you can acclimate yourself to this continued heat exposure, then you cool down and then you go back out. So you can build that tolerance and be fine doing like those bouts of heat exposure. What populations concern you? Meaning who is most vulnerable? We have a large retiree population here. Exactly. I'm thinking about elderly and I'm thinking about children when it comes to the most vulnerable populations. Are pre-existing conditions also a concern? Absolutely. If you have pre-existing medical conditions, you may even be on medications that can impact your body's ability to naturally regulate its temperature. Additionally, you may be on medications that may dehydrate you further, which can increase your risk of bad or negative outcomes from heat exposure. So absolutely. Quick follow-up to that question. How do I know if I am on the medications that you're talking about that maybe put me more at risk in a way of not realizing how badly the heat is affecting me? That's a great question. That's a more nuanced discussion to have with your own personal primary care doctor. I would just say, in general speaking, if you are on, if you have pre-existing conditions that require daily medications that you take, there is a chance that those could decrease your I'll call it um, uh, heat exposure potential, right? So for example, if you're on a water pill or a diuretic, that removes excess water from your body. Now, if you're outside, you, that is likely going to put you at higher risk for signs and symptoms of dehydration and subsequently heat exhaustion. I'm thinking about how much of a tourism area this is. We have people coming out of town every day. Do you have any special concerns when you're dealing with visitors who maybe aren't accustomed to this kind of weather? Absolutely. I think you hit the nail right on the head. It's that, like we talked about before with acclimatization, people have to get used to this level and consistency of heat. You know, I think last year we had several hundred thousand people move to the great sunshine state of Florida and visitors as well that come to central Orlando they are likely coming from places that are not used to or accustomed to this type of heat for this intense amount of time. So I always encourage folks that are visiting, whether it's family, friends, or even the theme parks that we have here, or if you've just moved here, you may not be able to do the things that you are used to from where you came from. So take it easy, make sure that you are hydrating before, during and even after events, if you're going to the theme parks and you're a visitor, make sure that you're planning your day appropriately. So you want to be careful with the hottest time periods of the day, right? So afternoon times like 2 to 6 p.m., even noon to 6 p.m., I would say, where it can get blisteringly hot. Plan for shade. Plan for breaks from the outdoors like we talked about, stepping inside for a moment. Hydrating with electrolyte-rich fluids as well as with um, foods. Fruits are also very hydrating, fruits and vegetables. What is your advice to people who have to be outside to make a living? Great question again. Making sure that you're taking necessary precautions to prevent things like heat exhaustion. So light clothing that is reflective, making sure that you are, of course, wearing sunscreen as well to protect against things like sun, uh, skin cancers, excuse me. Hydrating before, during, and after your uh, working outside. So remember, it's not just day of hydration, it's everything before and after as well. Electrolyte-rich fluids, hydrating fruits and vegetables, and then planning your day appropriately. If you are able to take breaks from the outdoor heat and maybe step inside a cooled area or at least a shaded area for a little bit, that can be beneficial. And then, of course, recognizing the signs and symptoms of heat exhaustion like we talked about before. So that way you can feel them and recognize them in yourself and in colleagues or coworkers that may be nearby you. We're in Florida. We know it's going to be hot. Is there some kind of 
metric or temperature that makes you as a doctor a little heightened, like, oh, we're starting to get into this temperature that's really has me concerned about something bad happening? You know, I, I don't have a set temperature point. I just um, generally say the deeper we get into summer and the hotter it gets, the more cautious all of us should really be. My biggest educational push for everyone would be, one is recognizing signs and symptoms, so that way you can be an advocate for yourself and other people. Understanding that hydration is just not about the day of, it's about the day before, during, and even after, and expecting changes to your typical routine. So if you're used to doing something outside, as we get deeper in the summer, it continues to get hotter, you're going to need to make adjustments and changes. If you are someone who exercises outdoors, anticipate that your intensity is gonna to have to go down. If you're someone who does yard work, anticipate you may not be able to spend as much time as you're used to as it gets hotter. And then just taking the necessary steps to plan ahead. So hottest parts of the day, try to avoid being outside if you can. Sunscreen, of course, skin cancer, we are in sunshine state. Um, those would be some of my biggest recommendations. And then of course, your special populations, elderly folks, and then children, you wanna keep a close eye on them. Dr. Shirag Panchel is a family medicine physician with Orlando Health Physician Associates. There's more ahead here on Engage. We ask an attorney who supports school chaplain programs whether satanic chaplains will be allowed to move forward with their plans to volunteer in Florida. All of our shows are available on demand at cfpublic.org. That is also where we are streaming live now. This is Engage on Central Florida Public Media. You're listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. I'm Sharon Stone. Ahead on this program, when you see ornately painted traffic boxes or wall murals in Central Florida, chances are they serve as much function as they do form. This traffic box, which is at the corner of this parking lot, it again draws people's attention to look in that direction. So hopefully if they go, oh, look at this nice traffic box has, has the picture of the birds and so forth, maybe see in the background, oh shoot, there's someone breaking into a car behind them. We examine the confluence between public art and public safety with the Maitland PD. First though, a statewide school chaplain program is now in place in Florida. Under this new law that took effect July 1st, School districts and charter schools can allow volunteer chaplains on campus to offer additional counseling to students. Parents must give written consent for their children to participate. And chaplains must pass a background check and have their religious affiliation listed on the school's website. Shortly after this law took effect, the Satanic Temple launched a campaign to have their chaplains in Florida public schools. When Governor Ron DeSantis signed the bill into law in April, he said they do not qualify for this program. Here's part of his speech. If these students have the ability uh, to get mentorship, uh, to get counseling from faith leaders, that is something that they should have the right to pursue if that is what they want. And this bill ensures that. And I think it's gonna make a positive impact on a lot of students throughout the state of Florida. Now, some have said that if you do uh, a school chaplain program, that somehow you're gonna have uh, Satanists running around in all our schools. I just understand, we're not playing those games in Florida. Uh, that is not a religion. That is not qualifying to be able to participate uh, in this. So we're gonna be using common sense uh, when it comes to this. So you don't have to worry about that. We have a variety of voices and perspectives to add to this conversation. Leah Patterson is senior counsel at First Liberty Institute. That's a legal organization focused on defending religious liberty. She's been involved in developing model policies for the Texas Chaplain's Law, which is similar but not identical. She joined Engage to explain why she supports the program. Government chaplaincy programs have a pretty long history in various contexts, and I think it is a good option to add for, you know, as a resource for students to add to an existing lineup. And you know, it's, it's, of course, very important that chaplaincy 
participation is voluntary for students. So no student should ever be forced to go to a chaplain and should have other options available. But adding chaplains to existing support services for students can provide a really good services for students of faith who want to be able to speak to someone like minded in that respect. Why, why chaplains? What's unique about this program that makes you say it's an added resource? Sure. So I think probably the example that I would go to is what I've seen in chaplaincy programs that police departments have, or some, you know, we've been involved in cases with uh, justices of the peace in Texas who have chaplaincy programs where if there's a car accident or someone's died, the a chaplain can uh, come and support if the people involved wish for that support, can pray with them, can talk to them. And you know, a lot of chaplains have specialized training for that. I know that's one of the complaints is these people aren't certified or trained as a lot of chaplains are. And one of the, the points that a school district could go to in developing a policy to implement under, under this law is to require that specialized training or certification. And chaplain, many chaplains do have that. So that's, that's something that can be added to an individual policy. To expand on it on that just a bit. People have brought up concerns here about a lack of training for volunteer chaplains entering the space with children. What is your response to people who have concerns that, you know, this might be a really well-intentioned idea, but chaplains aren't trained necessarily in identifying signs of trauma, for example? Well, I think what I would point to is to that the school districts can come up with the criteria they're looking for to screen out chaplains that don't have sufficient qualification or training to really get at what they're looking to provide to the students. And there are chaplain programs that are chaplain training programs that can offer those certifications. Chaplains have a lot of opportunity to uh, become certified in those ways. And so it's, it's perfectly doable for a school district to require that when they're choosing who they're going to have as a chaplain. The Satanic Temple has said it looks forward to volunteer chaplains in Florida and installing their own. Governor DeSantis has said it's not a religion, doesn't qualify, can't participate in this program. Are there any legal objections to either argument as to what could actually happen moving forward there? Well, I can speak for generally. I can't speak to the the specifics of how a particular case would would shake out. And uh, really, what I'd say is it depends on kind of what the qualifications a school district is looking to to require. You know, I don't think that a school has to take all comers in this kind of situation. This isn't really a forum. It's where a school is, you know, not hiring because they're volunteers, but they obviously have to look out for the safety of their students and put the right requirements in place so that the people who have access to their children are qualified. Now, there are arguments on both sides about whether the Satanic Temple is a religion or not. And I think that would depend on what the specific requirements in each policy is for what a chaplain is. I know that's a lot of legal gray stuff that says it depends, but it's very common in my experience for Satanic Temple to say inflammatory things to try to get programs shut down. And I, you know, it's, it's just really depends on what policy a school district develops to guide what chaplains are going to best serve their students. And if at the end of the day, a Satanic Temple chaplain applies to a school and a school decides that this person meets all their qualifications and there's demand for that, I, I mean, I guess they could choose to allow that person to volunteer, but it's not an automatic kind of situation. This is new to Florida, but you have it in Texas. What do you see the impact of chaplains and schools there being? Well, I think we're seeing a lot of questions, school districts, you know, asking how do we implement this? What does this look like? And you know, there's a lot of discussion of the general kind of separation of church and state language that you you typically hear. And I think the school districts are overall a little wary just because it's it's very it's so controversial. My kind of message would be that it's as long as you're creating an addition to existing support. You're not replacing support that already exists. You're adding a service um, 
where students can voluntarily choose to to avail themselves of it if that's something that they would draw comfort from and be supported in then i think that's a great opportunity and we've seen it work out well in other contexts you had mentioned that there are it's similar texas and florida bills but there are some differences are there any that you can highlight specifically that where the differences are sure the florida law requires parental consent so they have the parents have to sign off they have to say it's a that this particular chaplain is authorized to interact with my my child and that's a really great addition texas does not have that requirement in its overall law school districts could add that if they wanted to and but it's i think that's a really good part of the florida law is that it makes sure that you know that the, the big issue you're looking for when you're dealing with claims about the Establishment Clause and the so-called you know, separation of church and state, what the court looks for is coercion. Is this person being coerced to engage in religious activity? And if you have parental consent required, there's not a coercion risk there. That was Leah Patterson, senior counsel at First Liberty Institute. While she supports the program, others are raising concerns about good intentions backfiring. We're bringing Reverend Stuart Bentley into the conversation now. He is a chaplain at a children's hospital in Central Florida and part of a palliative care team to support medically fragile children and their family. Reverend Bentley joined us here on Engage to share some of his concerns about a statewide school chaplain program. First, I want to applaud that we're recognizing that children have rich spiritual lives that we should attend to and care for. So that, that's a great thing. However, if it is something that we want to prioritize, don't we want to have people that are qualified and trained? And so the lack of training requirements, the lack of qualifications that are being asked, this concerns me. So it's, it seems like a double messaging. Either it is important or it's not. And if we're saying that children are sacred, in my tradition, we would claim children are made in the image of the creator, um, so the children's spiritual lives matter. Well, then don't we want religious professionals to care for them? Not to say that these people that are volunteering are necessarily bad actors, although unfortunately the way the bill's written, there's no real guarantees that we're not getting bad actors. So that's yet another concern. But the big training, I um, and other chaplains in hospitals we had 1,600 hours of supervised training in the hospital. Um, we all completed at least master's degree levels of training in things like pastoral care and religious studies and learning about people's um, other faiths um, from the great spiritual traditions of the world. I don't see any of those requirements being asked of these volunteer chaplains. One of the things that we learn in our training as chaplains, we learn that while I came to this work out of my own sense of God's calling upon my life, that may or may not be useful to the patient or family in front of me. I need to bracket those ideas and religious beliefs in order to be able to best serve the family in front of me. This child may be of a different faith group than mine, or even just as possible, the same spiritual tradition, but a different interpretation, a different flavor. There is not one Buddhism. There's not one Christianity. Religious faiths aren't monoliths. And so learning how to meet a family where they are. The fastest growing spiritual identification in this country is spiritual but not religious. So learning what, what does that mean? How do we navigate those waters for a family that maybe they, they carry some religious trauma and while they still have yearnings for connection and meaning and beauty and awe and spirituality, it needs to be kind of unwrapped from any religious packaging that might trigger that trauma. And that takes nuance, that takes skill, that takes training, that takes education, all of which seems absent from this bill. Do you see any unintended consequence if someone is unable to 
compartmentalize their own beliefs that may differ from a child that they're working with? Absolutely. Children are highly impressionable. The conversations of spirituality are inherently intimate. And many children, not all, but many children want to please the adults that are in authority positions over them. And so quickly someone could be influenced to convert from a faith that has meant something to their family's faith system for generations to a whole new faith system to please this chaplain. So that's a worry for me of spiritual minorities. Our nation is predominantly Christian, but that doesn't mean we're only Christian. And so we have a rise of anti-Jewish sentiments in our country, Islamophobia. And so what what about a student that's already struggling with those issues coming to a person of a different faith who doesn't know how to bracket their own spirituality, their own religious biases? A further concern along those lines is I know that there's provisions in this bill that like parents can opt in or out whether they want the chaplain services. Well, that that could actually end up having a further exclusionary factor. Say I'm Jewish and I have my children at a school and the chaplain identifies as Christian and Everyone's fine with that. They're having prayer meetings and Bible studies and all of these things. Well, my child gets double identified. They're they're the kid that doesn't go to these meetings. So already excluded, already marginalized, and then therefore doubly so. So that's worrisome. I also worry for children that might be having questions about their sexuality or gender identity. And of course, that is a almost a minefield of political concern these days. Um, and so there might be listeners that would be like, well, yeah, I'd want, I'd want an adult to counsel that. Well, there's not a lot of training for a chaplain that goes into those discussions. We draw upon our religious resources, but that may not adhere with what your religious resources are. Maybe I am affirming of those things. Maybe I'm not. And maybe that's in opposition to what you are. So it, that, that's concerning to me. And, uh, and one thing I said earlier about the training, not only are they not being trained as professional chaplains, it seems like this bill, one of its advantages that it's listing is that it's almost a replacement for mental health professionals. Like it's, it's a way to get um, a counselor on campus for free. I'm not a mental health professional. I, I've read some books. The counsel I give is informed by mental health professionals, but it isn't a substitute for it. It is a complement. And so when I'm in a room and I'm worried about a child's, that their affect seems really flat and they're they're articulating some things that has, has me worried about self-harm. Well, I'm not qualified to make a diagnosis of depression or even flag them for suicidal ideation. I go to my, my colleagues who are counselors and they then make an assessment. And then if they think it's warranted, they might even then involve a psychiatrist. So there's a triaging of care. And so I'm all for trained chaplains being involved in in the the life of children and families, but not as a replacement for mental health professionals, and also not as a substitute for actually trained chaplains, so not using volunteers in, in, in in place of that. What are you hearing from other chaplains? In general, there's lots of concern. Um, I I am a, a chaplain in a a children's hospital. I belong to networks of other pediatric chaplains. Um, we care deeply about the lives of children and their families, the spiritual lives. We, we want to champion that. And so it, it is something that we're both, I, I, well, again, we're not a monolith, so I can't speak for those people either, but there's just the similar concern of 
of we went through training and there's not the training present there. There's really no obligation, even though it says that proselytizing won't happen. And for your listeners that don't know what proselytizing is, that's when I think my faith should be your faith. And there's lots of problems with that. But one of those is actually a constitutional violation of freedom of religious expression. I shouldn't be interfering with how your family understands their role in religious education. Like that's, that's not my role as a chaplain. My role is to undergird and support and nurture and amplify your connection with the divine. And, and this, that's at cross purposes with trying to make my faith your faith. And while these bills say proselytizing won't happen, I, I wonder and I'm suspicious that if these chaplains are quote unquote volunteer, meaning that the schools aren't paying for them, someone's paying for them. And so who are these chaplains accountable to? Personally, I have dual institutional loyalty. I am employed by a hospital, and so I have loyalty to this hospital, but I also have my faith group of accountability. That community holds me accountable. The beauty of having this dual institutional loyalty is the hospital says, you're not here in this place to convert people into your way of believing. The flip side is, my denomination, my, my faith group of accountability is like, you're there to, to uplift this child and family. And so if there's ever a situation where I feel moral responsibility that the hospital is not meeting the needs of the family, my loyalty to my community of, of accountability says I advocate for that family. I'm not on the side of the hospital. I'm on the side of the family. And so this dual institutional Loyalty actually frees me to be for the family. Whereas this volunteer chaplain, he is at the whim of of their donors. They are at the whim of their donors. And I imagine any donor is going to want a return on investment. And how do you measure that return on investment? I I don't know. I mean, mean, like it's, it's, it's potentially very frightening. I know, you know, more conservative religious groups are going to want conversion numbers. Like, even at, even as it says, that's not what we're doing. They're going to want to know how, how many kids came to accept this way of believing. I mean, that, that, that's, that's at its gross level, but other markers that they put forward are things like, a decrease in attempts of suicide or a decrease in active shooters. I don't know how they can make such a claim. I mean, if there's such training for that, then that should be shared widely amongst schools. I think kids need quality spiritual care. Kids need quality mental health. It is a rough world these days. If you've spoken to any kids in schools recently, they are traumatized by active shooter drills. They, they need to be surrounded by a community of adults that want their full flourishing. So I'm not saying that it's bad to bring more people in, but if we're really committed to the well-being of children, we should want quality trained professionals. Reverend Stuart Bentley is a chaplain at a children's hospital in Central Florida. We heard his concerns about a lack of trauma training for those counseling students. Charlotte McCullough is a licensed marriage and family therapist in Winter Park. She is trained in recognizing the signs of trauma in children. She joined Engage to discuss those concerns and implications of the volunteer school chaplain program. Although I do understand that it could possibly be a good resource for our students here in Florida, our students and our families. But the concern that I have as a licensed practitioner is that we'll have chaplains going in the schools doing counseling with our students as 
possibly with our students' families, but the only requirement for the chaplains is to have a cleared or passed background. So they're not required to have any trauma-informed care training or any other um, training for someone that will be doing counseling um, with children or with families. And so the reason why I think it's so important for anyone who's tackling counseling with someone sitting, talking through challenges or sitting, talking through skill building or just allowing someone to vent. The challenges or the risk of re-traumatizing a person who could possibly be traumatized is that there are different questions that a person can ask or different environments that they can put the person in that could totally trigger them around what they're coming to counseling for. So although, like I said, I, I recognize and I want to give credit to it being a resource for our students, but there's still concern there where this could be more harmful than helpful. Can you give me an example of a situation that you foresee could happen? Absolutely. So sometimes when in children, um, when they are traumatized or when they are going through a mental illness like depression or anxiety, it could possibly look like behaviors, like a, a bad behavior, or it can look like a child just acting out or a child being rebellious. But actually, some of the signs for children who are going through anxiety or depression, it could be behavior changes. It could be behaviors that really look like rebellion or resistance or a lot of fear or just being, you know, defiant. But it, underneath that, it could really be a mental illness. And then there's someone who don't know the correct answers or questions to ask could totally re-traumatize the child by disciplining them or talking to them from the perspective of discipline. And that really could not be the real issue. And I assume that you would have to have specific training in that so you're actually helping kids and not causing more harm, despite being, you know, well-intentioned. Absolutely. And, you know, when we say trauma-informed care, it just trauma-informed care just aims to be able to recognize, understand, and empathize with the impact of trauma on a child or with the family or an individual or those around them. And those that type of training could definitely make or break that experience for that child with a uh, chaplain as their counselor. Do you have concerns or have you experienced a situation where religion is a factor or someone's faith where maybe the chaplain is of a different faith than the child's family? Well, no, I haven't experienced that, but you know what, Sharon, I can see that possibly being a challenge with re-traumatizing a child because if the chaplain is of one faith and the child has been reared in a different faith, and let's just say that the child is having challenges around their religion or around some moral issue um, or some issue that their parents are enforcing in their homes, possibly if it's different from what the chaplain is uh, familiar with or believe in, depending on what they say to that child, it could be re-traumatizing. I mean, it could totally make things go in a different direction for the child. And from what I understand, that the parents would have to give consent for the child to receive counseling from the volunteer at the school, but still if the child is doing a one-on-one -on -one with the volunteer, we can't guarantee what would be said to the child, you know? So I could see that definitely being a challenge. Is there a need that this effort is attempting to address? As in, are there more counselors needed in schools or do we need more resources for kids? We definitely have a shortage in Florida when it comes to school counselors. There's definitely a shortage when it comes to clinical 
counselors in the schools. Um, but I, I do think that this is an attempt to have another resource for the children in Florida. It also speaks to there is attention on the child's mental health needs, not just their intellectual needs, but while we're creating a resource, we don't want to create a problem as well. What do you think a better solution is? Well, you know, Sharon, there are a number of things we can do, but for me, I would say creating more positions for clinical counselors, raising the starting pay for clinical counselors so that a job in the schools is more attractive where a family could take care of themselves and their families. I would also say creating some type of scholarships for people who are interested in becoming clinical counselors, creating those scholarships where people can go to college, uh, making it more attainable, affordable for them to go through that process to become a clinical counselor and different things like that. I think those are just to start there. I think it would be a huge difference. Sherlette McCullough is a licensed marriage and family therapist in Winter Park. Coming up, cutting crime through design. If you missed any part of our show today, you can always subscribe to the Engage podcast and listen whenever it is convenient for you. You are listening to Engage on Central Florida Public Media. This is Engage on Central Florida Public Media. Crime prevention through environmental design is a municipal planning philosophy. It juxtaposes public art and public safety. Referred to as SEPTED, the idea is to use sculptures and paintings in public places to both enhance the aesthetic and provide ways to encourage situational awareness among the people in these spaces. Daniel Holland is an officer with the Maitland Police Department. The application of SEPTED is important to him. He sees it used effectively to control crime. One of the biggest uses of public art is to reduce graffiti. At least in the United States, it's generally been true that graffiti artists won't tag public art. So they won't tag a mural, they won't usually tag a statute and so forth. So for so if there's a, a city's having an issue with a wall or some other side of building that is being used as uh, by graffiti artists, they want to reduce that. Uh, painting a mural generally helps. If someone's driving by and they see a blank wall and it's been tagged, for instance, or damaged, most people probably aren't gonna report that. Some might, but there's gonna be a large portion that will. But if someone sees a mural that's been either damaged or tagged, uh, then people are probably more apt to report that and will notice it. And uh, the, and that's how public art is, is generally used. In talking to you, you pointed to public murals as a way to deter the broken window effect in communities. Help us understand what that means. Can you elaborate? Sure. The idea with broken windows, uh, obviously, it's been very much debated recently uh, in recent years. But the idea that small small crimes will then turn into big crimes uh, with public art, again, it, it deters those lower level, it can deter those lower level crimes, such as graffiti and so forth. Um, and so that's, if you put, if you're having an issue with graffiti on a, on a wall, painting a mural uh, is definitely a great example of that. Um, also, you can use public art to draw people's attention. That's a big one. So for instance, what's very popular I've seen in many cities, for instance, Sanford has this uh, as well, any city with a with an urban core, or even a small one, where there's alleys, which may become very popular, are having those alleys painted. So that way, it draws people's attention to those dark spaces. Again, the idea being that it increases the chances of someone being observed. Because, again, if it's just a blank alley with nothing in it, people are probably just going to walk by it. But if there's a nice piece of art there, a nice sculpture even on the side or a mural, the chances of someone looking at it go up, that's a passerby, and then the chances of, of them reporting or seeing something suspicious go up. You mentioned that there was a picture you were going to send us, and can you describe to me what I would see looking at that picture and maybe some 
successes in it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I think it's a good example of uh, design in Sanford. And uh, it's when I was going to uh, the Willow Tree, which I love that restaurant, one of my favorite restaurants. And it is of this traffic box. And to me, this picture hits all the topics when it comes to septet and public art. First off, the traffic box is painted with a scene that is of local wildlife. So I believe there's a spoonbill bird painted on it along with other wildlife. And so it again invokes the local culture with it. You know, that's one thing that's important with septet and art is that it should invoke, in my opinion, it should invoke your 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 local culture and how important it is that citizens and, and everyone should feel like they have a sense of ownership over a space, right? Because they're more likely to then report suspicious things if they feel like, hey, that's Bill's house, or hey, that's Susie's, uh, you know, cupcake shop. You know, I feel a sense of, uh, of pride that, this, that, that, that those people have such nice things in my city. So they'd be more apt to connect and then report suspicious activity. So again, it has the, this traffic box, it has that local flair to it. It also is in a location that I think is a, is a great spot for natural surveillance because if you notice in the background, if you're familiar with downtown Sanford, uh, there is a big giant parking lot that they just paved over where people park and then they can walk around to local restaurants and so forth. Well, parking lots, very common for crime occur at every level from just breaking in to worse. And so they, this traffic box, which is at the corner of this park, near the corner of this parking lot, it again draws people's attention to look in that direction. So hopefully if they go, oh, look at this nice traffic box has, has the picture of the birds and so forth, maybe see in the background, oh shoot, there's someone breaking into a car behind them. But finally, which is the one reason that I like to point, I love this picture too, is that there is no perfect solution, right? There is no perfect strategy to keep yourself safe. If you're aware of one, please let me know. I'd like to know too. We know of the best strategies to reduce the chances of crime, but there is really, at the, unfortunately, at the end of the day, there is no perfect solution. And if you notice in the back behind it, there's a concrete pillar. And on that concrete pillar, someone had tagged it. So it illustrates that there is no perfect solution, but they didn't tag the traffic box that was painted. They went and they tagged this blank concrete pillar. So when I saw that, I was like, oh my goodness, this is perfect. I took that picture. I put it in almost every presentation I give about set down. Dan Holland is an officer with the Maitland Police Department. He gives presentations around Central Florida, educating the public about the use of crime prevention through environmental design. That's all for today's edition of Engage. We are back Thursday. I'm Sharon Stone. Thanks for joining us. All Things Considered is coming up.